Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Professor Hall and this is the second in our lecture about reading Lolita in Tehran. And uh, again, if you're watching this and you're just one of my other followers on YouTube or you just happen to come across this, this is just for a class about women's memoir and we are only focusing on the first part of the book. So if you want a full analysis of the whole book, um, other people might help you better, I guess, because we're just going to be talking about the first part. So in my other lecture, I talked about some of the books that she describes, our author, Azar Nafisi, and we talked about Lolita, we talked about Invitation to a Beheading, and we talked a little bit about A Thousand and One Nights, which is also mentioned in this first part. Um, this lecture, I really just want to focus on the book itself. We're going to go through um, all of the events, kind of a summary of what happens so that you're kind of aware of what's going on. I think that that can be helpful because the style of this book is quite a bit different from the other things that we're reading. The author is a professor of literature, and she, like some people in this room, uh, kind of likes books. <laughs> <laughs> she loves books. She's using books as a framework for her memoir, but as she's reading things, different memories and scenes and um, thoughts are coming up for her. And so this is not like we start in 1995 and go to 1996 and then 97, right? Um, what ends up happening is that we have a lot of flashbacks, a lot of flash forwards, and there's nothing really seriously to mark those points. In some other books, they do this with, um, you know, they'll make a notation or they'll say um, kind of very clearly, like they'll have a chapter that's a flashback. She kind of goes back and forth between um, the events that she's primarily telling us about, which start in 1995, and then going backward to some of her memories and even forward to the time in which she's writing, which is several years later. So I think that the summary can um, help there. I want to make a note right now that my dog is not happy that I am lecturing to you instead of petting her or taking her for a walk. So you might hear her whining a little bit in the background. I'm so sorry. Um, but today's the only day I have to record this. So at any rate, let's get into a little bit of history. Now, I have for you in our learning management system um, in Brightspace, there is another video about the Iranian Revolution. I just want to give you a little bit of that background um, without going into too much detail because that's going to set up um, some of what's happening in the novel, or sorry, in the memoir when it starts and some of what's informing the author. So we start um, in 1977, and essentially what happens in Iran is that you have um, in the, in a, around 1977, um, a number of journalists and intellectuals, lawyers, politicians who begin to speak out against the leader of the country. So they, they criticize openly the Shah of Iran. Now, what had been happening is that the Shah, who is leader, was bringing in a lot of reforms. And that sounds good, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, or I guess not all of the reforms were good. I'll put it that way. So what he was doing was trying to westernize the country. So he was trying to revolutionize education. He had a um, poetry festival. Um, he had um, some infrastructure things to um, kind of try to make Iran a little bit more globalized as a lot of the world, the countries of the world were kind of interacting more and becoming globalized as we move into the 1980s. So the thing is that while a number of the changes were um, at least seen as positive, for example, um, President Carter at the time said that Iran was like an island of stability in one of the most troubled areas of the world. And this caused a lot of problems because 
the Shah, although he was supported by some leaders in the West, was really quite an oppressive leader. So he was putting people in jail who spoke out against him. Um, a lot of the so-called reforms were forced upon people. And so there were things that many people who were Muslim were saying, like, this goes against our religious beliefs. And he was like, I, I don't care. You're here to serve me, basically. So you have um, what starts to happen is that a number of different groups then become enraged at the Shah. Um, if you read Persepolis, which I've taught in some of my other classes, um, that's a graphic novel by Marjane Satrapi. She describes the Iranian Revolution from a child's point of view. Basically, her parents had some communist kind of philosophies, and they were part of the intellectuals um, who were talking against the Shah and who were involved in some of these protests. So you had um, some people like that who, for political reasons, wanted him out of power. You had other people in rural areas in particular who were um, more conservative and more... Um, entrenched in their faith, and they wanted him out of office or out of power because of their religious beliefs. So you have some Islamists, you have some communists, and then you also have a number of students as well. So there were these student protests going on um, with colleges and things like that. A lot of those were um, political and philosophical as well. So what, what ends up happening is that there are these protests um, and they kind of come to a head in 1978. There is um, what's called an arson fire at the Cinema Rex. Um, protesters kind of um, blame each other, but there there's this huge fire and all of these kind of things are going on, right? And so eventually the Shah is removed from power. The small factions kind of battle it out for um, for power. And then you have the Ayatollah, who's talked about in Nafisi's book, um, and the Ayatollah Khomeini, who had been um, out of Iran, returns, and he is the leader of the Islamic Republic. So they have what's called a referendum, where they have a vote, and according to them, 99% of people who voted wanted Iran to then become an Islamic Republic now that the Shah was out of power. Whether those numbers are accurate, we don't really know because in a lot of instances like this, there's there's quite a bit of deception in terms of voting and that kind of thing. So fixed elections are, are not unheard of um, and neither are, you know, falsified um, records after the fact. So even if it had been voted in, um, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. That's the answer. So essentially, when this occurs um, in 1979, 1980, there is this new regime and the religious authority cracks down on uh, a number of changes that have taken place in the country. And many of Sorry for the camera. Many of those changes have to do with the roles of women. And in particular, there is a huge change in women's education. So a lot of women are um, prohibited for a while from being educated. There is a bar on co-education completely. So men and women are no longer allowed to be educated together. Um, and following the revolution... Um, a lot of universities and, and even high schools were shut down. They were not reopened for several years, um, three or four years. So all of this was going on. And then um, Iran basically um, entered into a war with Iraq. So the, the video that I'm showing you goes into a lot more detail. But I kind of want you to just have a background for some of the things I'm going to tell you about here. Um, because our book <laughs> opens in 1995. So at this point, the universities have been reopened, but they are still under this dictate that basically they have to um, 
promote um, or support at least Islamic values. And so in part because of these changes and some of the other things that she talks about, our author Azar Nafisi is a professor at the University of Tehran. And um, some of the changes, as I said, have been kind of softened by this point, by 1995. But she's been teaching for a long time, and all of this is in her background, right? Um, to, to some of you, it might sound like a very long time ago, but for her, writing in, um, the story starts at least in 1995. All The war only ended in 1988, so it's not really that long of a time period um, for a, a lot of these changes that, that kind of took place, really only 15 years um, 16, sorry, um, since the revolution in, in 1979. So um, that's where we start in chapter one. All of that has happened in the past, um, and she's going to kind of remember some of it through her memories as she talks about these books and what they meant in her life. So in chapter one, she has just resigned from her position teaching at the University of Tehran. She forms a group of seven women and they secretly meet to discuss literature. There is a male who wants to join them and basically she feels like that would be a little bit too dangerous to have a man in the group and also she wants kind of a safe space for women to kind of talk where in a lot of places they're not really allowed to. So they're meeting to describe literature. Um, she opens up with a long description of two photographs of the women. I want you to pay attention to that. We're going to talk about that in our discussions. Um, and then in chapter two, she goes into describing the place where they met. So she's really setting up a lot of things in these first few chapters to establish I had to pause for my dog. Um, she's doing this to establish um, where she is and who she's with. So it's kind of an extended um, narrative exposition. It's a, it's a fairly long narrative exposition to, to set the scene, as it were. But I'd really like for you to pay attention to the way that she describes things. She's got a style because she's a literature professor and um, because of her background. She has this very um, flowery style with a lot of a lot of imagery. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But um, because of that, I think you get a real picture for for who these women are and where they're meeting and, and all of that kind of thing. So in chapter three, she moves into talking about her reasons for leaving the university and what exactly happened that led her to that decision. As we go into the next couple chapters, she goes then back to the class. So she describes each student arriving in her door the first day. Um, for instance, there's Masid, who was jailed for five years for association with a dissident organization. Um, but there are girls, she says, of different religious views and different political views. And so she really wants you to know that this is not a homogenous group, that each woman has her own personality. And she's trying to kind of get that across. Chapter five is where we have a discussion of Arabian Nights, it's sometimes called, or a thousand and one nights, um, which I talked about in my other lecture. So, what I want you to know is that you know, some of the chapters are kind of dedicated to a book and her thoughts on the book and her students' discussion on the book. Um, but there's also, again, this very non linear thing where we're not just talking about a thousand and one nights here. There's also a mention of Nabokov and his book, Invitation to a Beheading. They talk about Upsalamba, um, which is just a word that is a combination of a couple Greek letters, Upsalon and Lamba, um, Lambda, rather. I can never say it <laughs> correctly, but they talk about this invented word, what it means to invent language, um, in relation to invitation to a beheading, what it means to invent stories in relation to A Thousand and One Nights. And this is a theme that is extremely pervasive throughout the entire 
narrative, um, that we find truth in fiction, that all of these all of these um, made up stories and the ones on the other half of the bookshelf that you can't even see, um, all of these made up stories that there is some element of truth in there. And sometimes we can realize something about ourselves or the human condition, or we can learn empathy by reading other people's stories. And that's sort of what this class is about too, right? This class, <laughs> not just her class, but this class, that we're reading other women's stories. Um, we're reading the stories of women rather to understand who they are, to understand their place in life, to understand their thought process, what they've been through, um, um, and we see, of course, recurring themes, education, imagination, um, the act of writing, the act of creating, gender roles and stereotypes and where they fit and where they don't. And so the, her class is kind of um, in probably a larger way than what we're doing here online, but her class is really uh, very much like ours in that sense, except that they're looking at fiction and we're looking at creative nonfiction, right? So um, at least I hope that's what we're doing. I don't know. <laughs> I'm recording this in the summer. I hope that by the by the fall and winter, that's what we're doing in our class. So um, yeah, so it's, it's a very exciting... Um, an interesting discussion, I think, given the the cultural differences that they're reading things that are, um, you know, from the Persian culture. They're reading things that are from Russia, from uh, later on, they look at Jane Austen, which we're not going to have time to get to, but they have things from, from, from Great Britain. They have things from France. They have, you know, all of these things, and they're able to um, share experiences with with characters and with authors, then I think that's kind of amazing. So we move into chapter six, which actually does focus on invitation to a beheading. And we have, um, as I mentioned in my other lecture, this idea that um, I, I really want to, I should say this here too. Um, a lot of People have criticized this book. Uh, the people who have criticized it have said that it is Islamophobic and that basically, even though she's from Iran, that she has um, a very westernized and possibly almost like a self-loathing kind of um, racism. I don't know whether or not I see that in this book. I think what happens in this book it's possible that she has some of that in some of her other writings, um, but I think what's going on in the book, at least, is that she is separating, which they don't in Iran because it is a theocracy. It's an Islamic republic, right? Um, but she's separating the government from the religion and then also the faith. And I think that she is critical of the government um, and I think that she is critical of institutions like the university that she worked at, which are kind of almost extensions of the government. So what we have there is a very like um, character versus society type of conflict. I don't see um, as much personally. I would really like to know if you do. This is one of the questions we'll have in discussion, but I don't see personally her attacking the religion or the faith. Um, I think that to her, those are two totally separate things. Um, and it's difficult because, you know, even in our country, people's faith kind of um, dictates a lot for them how they vote, for example, or who they vote for, or what issues they kind of support or don't support. But we don't have... Um, a state like the state that she's describing. So what happens basically in chapter six and then a little bit in seven where they're talking about invitation to a beheading, um, this is where some of those criticisms come up because she's saying that the, the prisoner in jail in invitation to beheading is kind of complicit in his own destruction and that you have a dance sort of that he's doing with the um, jailers and with the executioner and that he kind of has to 
give some kind of consent for them to treat him the way that they're treating him. And, and so that's difficult because it does sort of seem, um, like victim blaming. But I think the, what she's saying is when you're in an oppressive state, you have to rebel. And what the character in Invitation to Beheading does is, like Scheherazade in A Thousand and One Nights, he begins writing stories and creating fantasy worlds and then having made-up words like Upsalamba, um, which I still didn't pronounce correctly. Um, he, he starts doing that in order to kind of free himself. So you can kind of see that she's inviting her students in these chapters to do the same thing. Um, to have worlds of their own creation, to free themselves through literature where they can travel to different people's um, experiences, they can travel to different lands, they can, um, you know, have some of the life experiences that they're not allowed to have under this particular government. So what happens later in chapter eight, um, she describes... Her life in Tehran um, while the private class is going on, and she starts to ask the readers to imagine different people from the class. So in chapter eight, we watch Sanaz, and we're asked to watch her as she leaves the class and to kind of consider who she is in that room um, with other women where she can be herself and talk freely, and then who she is once she leaves that room and how her identity is kind of stripped from her. This stripping of identity and the idea of um, your personality kind of being co-opted or being erased, that's another theme that we're going to see throughout this book. In chapter nine, um, another student is discussed, Yasi. Yasi is her youngest student and she has some troubles. There are arrests in her family, her mother, her aunt, some of her female cousins, and so she's also rebelling in small ways. So we have um, two different descriptions of two different women, and they're kind of sandwiched in between a discussion of invitation to a beheading, and then in the next set of chapters, we come to Lolita. And some comparisons are made directly, some comparisons are not made directly. Um, when we talk about Lolita, as I said in my other lecture, we talk about a girl, um, really, really a girl, 12, um, at the beginning of the story, Dolores, and Dolores has her identity stripped from her, including her name. Um, she is asked to behave a certain way. She is asked to look a certain way. Um, her captor and molester, Humbert Humbert, basically um, wants her to become more sophisticated, but also wants to keep her young, um, takes away, in a sense, her mother from her. And so all of these pieces of her identity are kind of pulled away. So... As we move on through chapters uh, 11, 12, 13, we have a discussion of Lolita. First, um, Nafisi writes her notes up for the book, and then we have the class discussions. And one of the, one of the chapters is just about vulgar language. Um, and whether, um, is that a good thing or a bad thing, right? So it's great that you get to see people um, talking about language that's kind of been banned and situations in, in, in this book that are really taboo. And as they become more comfortable with one another, they really start to open up and they start talking about their own experiences. Um, one of the girls talks about, um, not in graphic terms, but she does talk about how she was abused as well and how she didn't really know what to do with that because of the stigma um, in that particular country and culture. In chapter 14, then we have a flashback. So we're in these class discussions and then the author flashes back to a time when she was called home uh, from boarding school in Switzerland. Her father, who was the youngest mayor in Toronto's history, had been jailed. So we travel back to kind of see 
some of the political turmoil that led to where they are now. You will notice also that she was in boarding school in Switzerland, which means that she had a European education and that she would have been considered westernized even at that point in time. Um, and this, of course, for her... Um, kind of causes some some difficulties later. Chapter 16, as we move on from Lolita, we have this scene with this man called the Old Magician. And he's basically an older academic professor that Nafisi knows. She's trying to get him to realize the brilliance of her students and to get his approval. And I think that this chapter is really important because what we have is... Um, even though the class is secret and the, um, all of the identities of the women are secret, she wants to tell somebody <laughs> and she thinks, I don't know, can I trust this guy? Maybe I can, maybe I can't. Will he see what I see? Um, can he, you know, it, it's like, it's like when readers have this look at Lolita and, um, at first, you're seeing this girl through the eyes of her, her captor and her abuser, and then eventually you finally get this picture of who this girl really is, that she is a young girl named Dolores, and that she um, is um, loves pop culture, and she's got kind of a smart aleck mouth on her, and like most kids, is unsophisticated, right? And... In a similar way, she is having this experience where she's seeing who her students really are, and she's getting a look and a glimpse at their lives and their real personalities that she would not have had in a regular classroom setting, and she just wants somebody else to acknowledge that, and it's... it's she doesn't really get the acknowledgement that she's kind of looking for. Then we move back into some class discussions. We talk about invitation to a beheading, which I've already mentioned. And we also talk about Madame Bovary. Now, Madame Bovary, I did not talk about in the last lecture, but I'll just mention it briefly here. It is about a woman who marries a country doctor and kind of lives outside of her means. Um, she wants a better life than the one that she has, basically. She's dissatisfied. Out of that dissatisfaction, she begins having an affair, and it is a tragic book in the end. Um, but here is what Nafisi had to say, and I think this quote is so great. If I can find it. Okay, first she says, we read Persian classical literature, such as the tales of our own lady of fiction, Scheherazade from A Thousand and One Nights, along with Western classics, Pride and Prejudice, Madame Bovary, Daisy Miller, The Dean's December, and yes, Lolita. As I write the title of each book, memories whirl in with the wind to disturb the quiet of this fall day in another room in another country. And then she kind of goes into some of the things that cropped up in their discussions. After that, she says, after our first discussion of Lolita, I went to bed excited. Why did Lolita or Ma Madame Bovary fill us with such joy? Was there something wrong with these novels or with us? Were Flaubert and Nabokov unfeeling brutes? By the next Thursday, I had wanted I could not wait. I formulated my thoughts and I could not wait to share them with the class. Um, and then she goes on to say, every fairy tale offers the potential to surpass present limits. So in a sense, the fairy tale offers you freedom that reality denies. In all great works of fiction, regardless of the grim reality they present, there is an affirmation of life against the transience of that life, an essential defiance. This is why we love Madame Bovary and cry for Emma, and we greedily read Lolita as our hearts break for its small, vulgar, poetic, defiant, orphaned heroine. Now, there is a lot in there that I'm cutting out because I'm kind of just um, uh, 
picking a few short quotes from a longer piece for you, but this is what I think is great. The affirmation lies in the way the author takes control of reality by retelling it in his or her own way, thus creating a new world. Every great work of art is a celebration and act of insubordination against the betrayals horrors, and infidelities of life. The perfection and beauty of form rebels against the ugliness and shabbiness of the subject matter. And this is why we love Madame Bovary, <laughs> Bovary and Cry for Emma. Um, yeah, so I think that those quotes, you can kind of see her themes here, that um, this is the potential to surpass the limits of where we live and to live outside of our own experiences, right? And to learn more about ourselves and the world around us. So we move from there into um, the last part of this section. She jumps into the future in chapter 19. Um, she describes an incident in Washington, D.C. while she's actually writing this memoir. Um, and she's reminiscing about Tehran. And this part, I think, is particularly interesting, so I wanted to point it out, that she talks about distancing language and says that people that she knows now who live in the United States or in other countries, so expatriates from Iran, people who've left, they use distancing language and that her children, in particular, separate themselves from the people's and memories of Iran. So they will say things like they and the people over there and back there, stuff like that. So um, it's kind of interesting because her memories, when she talks about them, are, are right here, right? They're like immediate and they're with her. They're not kind of far removed in that way. In chapter 21, um, we have a discussion about the veil and again, I think this is where some of the criticisms of the book come in. But again, she's not necessarily criticizing the religious beliefs. She's criticizing the way that they have been imposed by the government. Um, so that's kind of an important distinction to make. But they discuss fully covering women just to quench or stop um, the sexual appetites of men. And um, that is an important discussion that, of course, ties back to Lolita, where um, you have a girl just being a girl who is um, painted as a temptress, even though she really is not. Um, so I think that even though there may not be direct links or comments made, that's something to watch for. And then at the close, we have a little bit of a discussion of Naboko's own memoir. And here um, is really where things kind of come together full circle. We have the essays, the poems, the drawings of students, and um, she asks them to describe their image of themselves. So finally, we have a space where these women can go outside of their gender roles um, if they want um, or if they feel like they need to, and they can be free and they can freely express themselves. And so like an invitation to a beheading, they're invited to create. And by creating, um, they're taking back their identity, which is something that eventually Dolores is sort of able to do in the book Lolita. So those are some of the parallels and some of the things that she talks about in these chapters. It does not seem to be um, as fast of a moving book as some of the other ones that we've read or some of the ones that we're going to read. Certainly, um, Member of the Family by Diane Lake is quite a bit different, but it's a little bit similar to Ruth Reichel's book, um, Tender at the Bone, and some of her memoirs, because she's telling stories through food and through her memories of being at the table with family, with friends, and, and even um, cooking meals for herself. So I think what's interesting is the different ways in which women decide to tell their stories, whether it's a little bit more like autobiography that we had with Maya Angelou, whether it's through books like we have here, whether it's through um, cooking and food and memories of that like we'll have later, um, whether it's kind of almost uh, a, a little bit... Um, 
uh, fragmented. We'll see that again with uh, Susanna Kaysen's book, um, Girl Interrupted. So with all of those things, I really want you to pay attention to the style, not just the nonlinear um, telling of this, but the imagery that she uses, some of the symbols in the book, the green door, the veil, the books themselves, um, the photographs of the girls, their clothing, and what they're creating and what she's creating, because they really are describing there's this motif, a repeated um, a repeated uh, element of writing and creation and the telling of stories and the reading of stories and the analysis of stories. Um, so those are some things to look for. Some themes I'd like you to look for, freedom versus oppression, imagination um, versus um, being kind of uh, stifled and, and stuck gender roles and expectations, obviously gender differences, education, I think pretty clearly, um, rebellion, imprisonment, and institutions, as well as change. The biggest thing is going to be identity. Um, who are we? Who do we define ourselves as? How do, does the world see us, particularly when that world is driven by men? Um, how do men look at women and how do women kind of respond to that gaze and then try to kind of break free from it to have their own um, empowered lives So uh, and their own perspectives on the world. So it's a very feminist book. I hope that you enjoy it and I hope that this cleared some things up for you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>